Well, hello everyone, uh, my name is Vic Bajaj. I am uh, the CSO of a California startup called Grail, uh, whose mission is to detect cancer early when it can be cured. And we're here at the GAP Summit. I'm here with my colleague, Philip Nelson. Yeah, so hi, I'm, I'm Philip Nelson. I'm a director of engineering at Google. Google is also a California startup, but we're quite large now. So, um, and I lead a research team who's sort of applying the best technologies Google has to important life sciences problems. Okay. And I, I think in the session this morning, uh, we've heard a lot of discussion about precision medicine, about big data, the mm -hmm. intersection of big data with medicine. So I thought maybe we can have a conversation about that. Sure, um, sure. I mean, so maybe first of all, we could describe how we both got into this field. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I was always, um, I, you know, I, I caught the computer bug early, but medicine to me is the sort of highest calling, Make, keeping people healthy, making them healthy. And you know, as an undergrad, I actually got to work at Harvard Medical School on artificial hips and knees, but I got the computer bug and that ultimately lured me to Google. And then I had this opportunity sort of with this explosion around deep learning to bring this technology back to medicine. So my wife tells me I live in a bubble. She's, Google pays you to do medical research. How is that possible? And I'm thankful every day. It's just, this is such an exciting time too. The technology innovations are incredible and we'll talk about them. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, you know the story quite well. Uh, I was uh, an academic, having spent part of my career in startups, but most of it in academia. And I became interested in problems related to cancer systems biology. The idea that we could measure enough about cancer and that our analytical tools in silico and in the laboratory were now powerful enough that we could begin to understand it through principles of engineering mm -hmm. rather than completely empirically. Mm -hmm. And around that time, I realized that the scale needed to do this, both of the experiments and um, the data analysis, really could only be met in an industrial yes. setting. So that's what attracted me to Google, uh, mm -hmm. the chance of working with people like you, yes. with yes. you personally. Uh, and so that's why I left and, and uh, spent what yeah. we had uh, four years together yeah. there. Yeah, well, it's very, it was very exciting for people like you to come in because we're the computer scientists, we know what we don't know, or we, we imagine how much we don't know in this field and then linking our expertise with your expertise I think is where the magic happens. So. so maybe we should get into this in a little bit more detail and start by defining what is data science, what is machine learning, what's all of this terminology first of all, and then what is the opportunity at the intersection with the life sciences? Yeah, well so, um, uh, you know, the, a lot of these terms are thrown around like big data and machine learning and, you know, um, big data is great. Like a lot of it is if you can just gather data and bring it together and just mine that data, there's all sorts of amazing insights that can come out of that. And machine learning is a little bit different. Machine learning is trying to predict the future. And so big data is a, is a means to the end. But they're, they're, they're sort of subtly different. And I think that you know, there, there's just a lot to be had just from bringing data together. But that's just the beginning. Where we can actually do forward predictions is where it gets exciting. And, and there's a new exciting area, which we can talk about, where the machines have gotten to this point now where they can actually propose new hypotheses from the data. And I think this is, uh, you could see this in the chess game versus the go game, which has been in the news recently. You know, when, when uh, computers beat the best chess player, nobody was really terribly surprised. It was just relentlessly perfect play. But with Go, there's whole new strategies have been yes. opened up. Like the Go players are so excited, they can, they're seeing things that have never been seen before. And to me, that's the promise of some of this technology. But of course, it comes this into your expertise about what problem are you trying to answer even? And, and do you actually have good data? So that, that's what has uh, always impressed me most about the work that you and your group uh, has done. It's your respect for the well-formulated scientific hypothesis mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the question probed clearly uh, and effectively. And I think too often we see at the nexus of big data and the life sciences uh, a disrespect for basic statistics. Yeah. You know, these methods can't hallucinate statistical power where none exists. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think maybe the audience um, would benefit from just an overview of a couple of examples that your group has been involved in in the life sciences and imaging in particular. Sure, sure. So, you know, as you know, we recently published an article in JAMA 
about um, uh, predicting diabetic retinopathy. And we do it as well as essentially as a panel of experts. And in order to do that, we actually had to gather well over 100,000 images. And we paid a large team of doctors to get about 850,000 distinct diagnoses. And even then, we, you know, it's still a challenge for us to distinguish, say, like uh, mild from moderate, like yes. the, some of the subtle parts of the disease. Now, we're extremely good at sort of what would be referable to a doctor, but this is just sort of an example of the scope of the type of data you need even to ask simple problems. Now, that's not the case where you always need that kind of data, but you need a clear understanding of the prediction you're trying to make. And oftentimes, you know, one of, there's many ways to do machine learning wrong. So for example, um, if you are training on data that you're testing on, you might actually be memorizing the answer and not actually generalizing it. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of ways to, to go wrong. You can also sort of like try to, there's this whole thing called hyperparameter optimization where you're basically tuning the dials to be perfect, but it's perfect for that data set. So there, there's, I mean, I can tell you a dozen stories of failures in machine learning. It's very easy to fool yourself. There's a really interesting example that came from Google's photo analysis, where we realized that the machine's model for a barbell had an arm attached to it. Yes. And so, like, this is not something that a, uh, a human would ever do. So it's very easy to trick yourself. And so being really honest and, and skeptical and having really well formulated propositions is critical, and you're you're always amazing at this. Yeah. So. Well, thank you. Uh, no, but th that's what I think in this industry as we begin to apply these models, uh, where there is even latent complexity in the way that the model is set up. Mm -hmm. There is mm -hmm. such a danger of overfitting yep. that it points to two things. One is the need for in the healthcare applications a rigorous clinical experiment, mm -hmm. one that unambiguously will get you to those endpoints, mm -hmm. and that has built in a strategy with robust cross-validation um, during the training phase mm -hmm. and independent validation. Yes. Yes. And I think for companies getting into this, um, building that culture of statistical rigor within yes. the company, yes. even yes. more so than exists in most companies in, in, in my industry as I found it, um, that's absolutely critical. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, we've, um, we work with many labs, and you know, we're fortunate being Google in that we have resources, but it's really surprising and unfortunate how often they don't even understand the variance on some of their experiments. Like, if you ran the same experiment twice, what would you get? And we yes. can afford to run some of those experiments, but that's the kind of work that's really needed to, to not fool yourself. Right, so. right. And I, I think, um, given the subject of the GAP Summit, uh, we should perhaps both reflect on the kinds of people that we hire uh, mm -hmm. in our groups. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say the discipline of bioinformatics and computational biology and data science, these terms are used interchangeably, but really what, what we look for um, is a mixture of skills. And you yeah. can't always find those in the same individual. Mm -hmm. But there are people who are great software engineers. They mm -hmm. know how to build the tools that we need, the experiment frameworks, the systems to, first of all, organize the data, make it analyzable and mm -hmm. make the analysis reproducible. That's mm -hmm. absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. There are others who come from a statistics ML background yeah. and can powerfully and objectively analyze the data. And then of course, equally important is having a sensitivity to the limitations of the experiment, uh, an understanding of the biology, and that's yes. where computational biologists and bioinformaticians are so valuable. Mm -hmm. So we try to assemble groups with people who have you know, each of these three skills in varying degrees. Yes. Yeah. I know it's different for your group, but... We're maybe a little bit more biased towards the mathematical and uh, computational aspects, but uh, it's sort of like a Venn diagram, and you need a lot of overlapping circles. You can't just put the mathematician circle next to the computation next to the biologist. So people, you know, for, especially for people in school now, take that statistics course, <laughs> you know, I, I understand data. So you don't have to be perfect at it, but, but understand the language of the person who you're working with. And in the same way, the mathematicians need to understand the language of the biologists. We've spent weeks and weeks and weeks, we have reading groups, and uh, I spent some time at, at Harvard Medical School. We are trying to educate ourselves at least to know enough to be dangerous, 
but being humble too about what you know and what you don't know, but sort of have a superpower, but be able to spread yourself around and, and speak that language. And that's, I think, where the magic happens is bringing these disciplines together. Because yes. each, uh, there's amazing people in each group, but there, there isn't enough bridging yet. And I think we're both trying to do that. Yes, and I, I think if there's one thing that um, really is typical of Silicon Valley's entry into the life sciences, it's that most of the companies that are successful in this space, we're successful because we're in really arranging this productive collision of disciplines, mm -hmm. but we're mm -hmm. being really rigorous and honest in the application of methods from each of them, yeah. yes. uh, so yes. as not to fool ourselves. Yeah, and that you know, it's very different writing a paper too. So the incentive mm. structures matter, and yes. you know, the ability to publish something versus the ability to actually build a production system. I mean, even just earlier today, we were talking about even when you've got the right medicine and the right diagnosis you know, are, is the follow through happening? Are the patients taking the medicine? So if you really want to change the world, you have to really think sort of end to end about these systems and not just one specific part, so. Um, so let's uh, discuss one last thing. And it's actually what you mentioned, how we're going to put these things into practice and realize a clinical benefit. And I always go back to the story of the first kind of intervention, clinical intervention based on big data. I went over this um, today as well. Uh, and that's this famous study uh, that John Snow conducted of a cholera outbreak in London, this, yes. where by plotting the cholera incidents on a map, mm -hmm. he found that they were clustered around a pump handle. And he recommended an intervention, removing the pump handle at a time when no one really understood the pathological basis of the disease. Yeah. Uh, and of course yeah. it worked. And so the lesson for me is, of course, you need statistical power, you have to have all of the examples to make the right judgments and statistically reasonable judgments, but um, you don't have to understand the mechanism. Yeah. You can remove yeah. the pump handle and test its efficacy without understanding why yes. it works. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to me, that's always been a, a, a very comforting analogy in the use of these deep yeah. learning methods. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very compelling because empirically, we can build these black boxes with millions of numbers in them that make these compelling predictions, and, and it's incredibly useful. But to be able to actually bridge that and to get from that pump handle to the explanation of microbes, that's really where I think some of the future magic will be. The upcoming generation will have to provide some of that magic is to yes. bridge those worlds. But yeah, it, it's very true. The empirical observations and the, and the underlying theory, there's, there, there's some difference between the theory and the practice. So. Well, I think we're out of time. I encourage everyone watching to review the other materials on the GAP Summit site. Uh, and thank you for uh, watching us. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting us.